A lot of stuff with hemoglobin. And we haven't finished. So I didn't get a chance last time to talk about fetal hemoglobin, which is uh, another remarkable hemoglobin. It's very closely related to adult hemoglobin. And it um, is something that our body makes, depending upon what age we are. You can see on the graph that um, there's a big change that happens around birth. Prior to birth, the fetus is making uh, what we call, of course, fetal hemoglobin. And it's slightly different. Instead of being alpha 2, beta 2, um, fetal hemoglobin has a structure known as alpha 2, gamma 2. Gamma subunits are similar to beta subunits, but they're not identical. And you can see that uh, at about birth, we see the gamma subunit uh, declining. We see the alpha subunit is high most of our lives. The fetus has a high level of gamma, and then that changes at about birth, and beta starts uh, being produced. What's the differences? Well, the primary difference is that the gamma subunit, when it's paired, or the gamma subunits, when they're paired with the beta, with the alpha subunits, they um, form a donut, but the whole doesn't have quite the same dimensions as it does for the alpha two, beta two. And what that means then is that the uh, fetal hemoglobin cannot bind 2,3-BPG. Adult hemoglobin binds 2,3-BPG. Fetal hemoglobin does not bind 2,3-BPG. And you recall that the 2,3-BPG um, converts the R form into the T form. What it means then is that the fetal hemoglobin is in the R state much more so than the adult hemoglobin is. And the R state, you recall, has greater affinity for oxygen. And it's for this reason that the fetal hemoglobin has greater affinity, uh, affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin does. And this is how the fetus takes the oxygen away from mom. And of course, after birth, that uh, necessary uh, function of taking oxygen away from mom isn't necessary. And so gamma starts declining and beta starts increasing. You can see the plots uh, here of the uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin in the uh, orange versus the adult hemoglobin uh, in the green on the right. And you remember for these plots that I've shown you, as we've moved to the right, we have less affinity. As we move to the left, we have more affinity. And so this graph is now reflecting what I've just told you about the uh, proclivity for hemo uh, fetal hemoglobin to um, uh, have higher affinity for oxygen. Another factor to consider with hemoglobin is that of sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia, uh, everybody has heard of. It's a genetic disease. Um, it comes in many forms, actually, but it's a genetic disease that affects hemoglobin. It was the first uh, genetic disease that was identified as a genetic disease. And some of you may get tired of me talking about Linus Pauling, but Linus Pauling got another first there. He was the first person to identify a genetic disease and this as a genetic disease. In, fetal, in um, sickle cell anemia, red blood cells lose their rounded shape. And this happens uh, during conditions of low oxygen. And under conditions of low oxygen, the hemoglobin that's in those red blood cells actually polymerizes. It causes the red blood cell to then lose its rounded shape and become sickle shape, which is what gives it uh, its name. This happens most commonly, as they say, under low oxygen conditions and frequently during exercise. People who have sickle cell anemia uh, will have difficulties with uh, exertion uh, because that's when the sickling and the polymerization of the um, the hemoglobin will occur. You can actually see this pretty readily in a microscope. You see on the uh, two images on the screen that you see the sickled, uh, sickled cells, uh, which have a shape that is not smooth and rounded like the uh, other red blood cells that surround them. And that turns out to be really critical uh, with the ability of these cells to move through our bloodstream, particularly through the capillaries. As I said, the change is caused by polymerization of hemoglobin under low oxygen conditions. So the rounded cells uh, of our blood system are really designed very well to move through capillaries. Capillaries, of course, little tiny uh, blood vessels where the um, uh, red blood cells are in closest contact to the tissues needing the oxygen. We can see this schematically depicted here where we have uh, a capillary, uh, uh, both top and bottom, the difference being in the bottom where we have sickled cells. And those sharpened, edgy, sort of uh, 
sickle cells don't travel re uh, readily through the capillaries. They get stuck. Well, you can imagine if you start plugging up your capillaries that you're going to have some issues with getting blood supply through there, and blood supply, of course, necessary for oxygen. Uh, if this happens under severe conditions, uh, this can actually be fatal. Um, in many cases, people just experience very intense pain as associated with uh, the problem. Uh, and uh, of course, neither of those is, is, is desirable. The sickled cells uh, are recognized by your spleen as being problematic, and they're removed. And so the reason this is called an anemia is that people who have sickle cell anemia uh, have a low red blood cell count because the spleen is taking out of the blood supply cells uh, that have assumed this sickle shape. So one of the questions people asked for a long time was, well, this is a genetic disease, and it's, it's still fairly prevalent. It's, it's quite prevalent around the world. Why is it that it's still present in the human population? We find it in every race, every culture. There are some differences among uh, some of the races in terms of how, how frequently it appears. Uh, but it's found everywhere. Why is it that it's there? And the answer to the question came when people overlaid uh, on the map of the world the uh, incidence of sickle cell anemia with the incidence of malaria. And the two overlapped. The most common places that malaria was found were this, was also the most common places that sickle cell anemia was found. And though, I, as I said, sickle cell anemia is abundant around the world, these were the most common places that they were found. So there was the thought then that perhaps sickle cell anemia provide, might be providing some sort of uh, protection against malaria. And it looks like that's the case. Numerous studies now have shown this. And it turns out that the benefit of sickle cell anemia is not for one who suffers from the disease. Okay? So remember that we are um, um, individuals that have 2X chromosome. We have, we have two copies of each chromosome. And so we can be homozygous for something, meaning that we have two identical copies of a gene. We can be heterozygous for something, where we have one copy of a gene and an altered copy of a gene. Or we can be homo homozygous uh, with the uh, two bad copies of a gene, for example. Well, it turns out that if you have two bad copies, that's what it takes to have sickle cell anemia. If you have one good copy and one bad copy, that is your heterozygous, um, that, those individuals appear to be protected against malaria compared to people who either have two bad copies or who have two good copies. Okay? So there is a benefit uh, for individuals carrying one copy of the sickle cell gene. Uh, and it appears to affect uh, young people more so than older people. That is, people who, who are heterozygous are more likely to survive uh, malaria infection if they're young. Okay? So genetic disease, obviously problematic. Uh, when we see it persist and doesn't get wiped out of the population, there's commonly a reason. And this was the reason uh, for sickle cell anemia. Well, I've gone through a summary here. I'm not going to go through all the points. I'll just briefly show them. I'll let you review those. These are all things that I have talked about uh, with respect to hemoglobin. And you see hemoglobin's got a lot of stuff going on. To summarize hemoglobin, I have yet another song. I thought we would go through that. And then we'll dive into techniques. It's called The Bloody Things. It's to the tune of the old Coke, It's the Real Thing song. If nobody in here probably is old enough to remember that, but bear with me. And I've got to turn it on, as I always forget. Notch of irons up a notch and yank on his studies. The globe and shapes will change a bit. Oh, what a sight to see. The way they bind to oxygen cooperatively. As I exit from the lungs to swim in the bloodstream, metabolizing cells, they all express their needs to me. To them, I give up oxygen change from R to T. All my amines, they hang on to the protons readily. That's not all the tricks I know. There's more that's up my sleeve. 
gaps between subunits that hold two, three BPG. When near metabolizing cells, I find things that diffuse the protons and bicarbonates from lowly CO2s the way it when your cells are at play, go say hip hip hooray for the bloody thing. That's the way it is. Okay, good enough. All right. In England, bloody means something very different than it means here, so people watching in England may be amused at that. Okay, so um, before I move on, questions about hemoglobin or anything I can tell you about hemoglobin? You'd like to know? Clear as mud? There. So, the question is does it go from T to R or R to T when hemoglobin is getting oxygen? Is that the question? Okay. So in the lungs, hemoglobin arrive, arrives there in the T form. Binding of the first oxygen helps to flip it into the R form. And that's why cooperativity works, because the R form is more likely to bind oxygen, and it actually changes its binding state. So binding oxygen converts it into the R state. Question? I, I'm sorry, so, so since the... It doesn't bind to the heme, so carbon dioxide does not bind to the heme. Okay, so the question was, since carbon dioxide doesn't bind to the heme, but I said that it affects the affinity for oxygen, how does that happen? Is that the question? Okay. So it happens in the same way that protons affect that. Protons don't bind to the heme either. They bind to histidines that are not part of the binding to the heme, separate histidines inside of the globin proteins, both the alpha and the beta. And that causes a conformational change. And that conformational change favors the release of oxygen. So the same thing happens with carbon dioxide. In fact, carbon dioxide will bind to the same histidines, cause that conformational change, and favor the release of oxygen. So it doesn't take something binding at the heme necessarily to affect the binding affinity. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Question over there? Yes? Um, does oxygen bind sickle cells with sickle cells with the right cells? So does oxygen bind sickle cells? That's a really good question. Um, with the heme in the, uh, I'm sorry, with the hemoglobin in the um, polymerized state, its ability to bind oxygen is almost just completely gone. And what more likely happens is that the sickled cell will just simply get removed by the spleen, in which case it doesn't make it back to, to, to participate in binding of oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Does each subunit of hemoglobin have its own R and T state? Yeah, that's a little confusing. I showed that transition where I went from square to circle, and then I showed some of them that were kind of rounded. Okay. So they're sort of in a transitional mode to become in that R state. You can think of individual units in R. You can think of individual units in T uh, if you want. You can also think of the whole complex. I don't try to distinguish those two. In fact, it's the entire complex that's relevant. But either, either thing is fine for our purposes. OK? Yeah? So two questions. First question, is it one oxygen per heme subunit? And the answer is yes. Can I recap on the polymerization of hemoglobin in, in sickle cell anemia? OK, so the only thing I, I said about it was that uh, under low oxygen conditions, which is what happens in capillaries. Remember, we get to capillaries, the hemoglobin is letting go of its oxygen. The cells are grabbing it, particularly if there's a lot of protons there, particularly if there's a lot of carbon dioxide there, which is what's going to happen during exercise, right? So when those low oxygen conditions happen, the, heme has let, the, the hemoglobin has let go of all of its oxygen. It's much more likely to form polymers if it's the sickle cell form. And that's, that 
polymerization is what gives the red blood cell its shape. So in the absence of polymers, hemoglobin is existing as single units of four. Okay, you've got the four proteins there always. But now in the polymerization, you've got units four, 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 all lined up as a polymer. Okay? And that's that, that polymer that's giving that uh, sickle shape. So the sickling is arising from the connection of multiple to form, and that's what I'm calling the polymer. So you've got alpha, beta, alpha 2, beta 2, alpha 2, beta 2, alpha 2, beta 2, alpha 2, beta 2. So you've got a whole long line of those stuck to each other. That's a polymer. Okay? Your question? Okay. Let's talk about protein purification uh, characterization. So. It's uh, one of the things that we uh, have learned is something about structure of proteins, and we've spent some fair, a fair amount of time talking about charges of amino acids in proteins. And your recitations, you either have been or will be doing uh, that as well. So hopefully you're uh, getting on top of the significance of that. We can use our knowledge of the chemistry of proteins as a means of, of um, purifying them. Now, some of the things I'll talk about here today apply to things besides proteins, but proteins are probably the best example that we can think for uh, these purification techniques. If I want to um, isolate biochemicals, I have to start with the source of the biochemicals, which, of course, are living cells. And living cells provide a barrier uh, for me getting the uh, biomolecules out of them, that barrier, of course, being the cell membrane. So in order for me to um, isolate biochemicals made uh, inside the cell and residing inside the cell, I have to uh, have a way of getting at them. Well, there are a variety of ways that people get at the uh, materials inside of cells. You have to open the cells. And there's some very cool uh, techniques that people use to do it. One is known uh, as a sonicator, and that's actually what you see here. Sonicators are um, machines that produce very intense sonic waves and those sonic waves mechanically bust open cells, and the, the cells then spill the contents into the mixture that you've got the cells uh, sitting in. Another cool thing people do with uh, cells is they um, explode them. So exploding cells doesn't involve dynamite. It actually involves something called a French press. And so French, with a French press, what you do is you take cells and you put them into a, a, a liquid buffer of some sort, and you apply, uh, through hydraulic um, uh, means, a tremendous amount of pressure to that liquid. So it's very, very, very intensely pressurized. And then you uh, immediately release the pressure. And so when that happens, the cells, which have been very, very compressed, all of a sudden go boing. They explode. And the um, contents of them, again, spill out. So there's a variety of ways of getting at things. Sometimes we use enzymatic means. It doesn't really matter. But the important thing is that we're opening the cells up so the contents come out. After we get the contents out, we use typically uh, centrifugation, uh, using centrifugal force as a way of separating the big guys from the little guys. So the big guys will include things like the membranes, may include organelles like the nucleus, mitochondrion, depending again, of course, on how we've opened the cells up and what we've done to them. But suffice it to say that the size of the material that we're interested in will have a different velocity in a centrifugal field. And so we can separate things roughly on the basis of size using a, centrifugal, uh, a centrifuge. The key to isolating anything is fractionation. Fractionation, meaning that you are isolating using a treatment to separate things into usually one versus the other. So for example, uh, a fractionation that might happen with centrifugation would be I would take uh, my busted open solution and I would spin it at, let's say, relatively low uh, centrifugal force. And under low centrifugal force, the very biggest things will precipitate. They'll come to the bottom of the tube. This may include, like I said, uh, membranes and things like that. The smaller things, the biomolecules, the soluble proteins and so forth, will not precipitate at the bottom. So if I pour that off, I've got one tube that's got liquid that's got what didn't precipitate, and I've got another tube that has stuff stuck to the bottom that did precipitate. So I've just fractionated. I've, I've separated them. Okay? So fractionation simply means separating on some basis. 
One of the most uh, simple techniques uh, that we uh, work with, uh, and it's a very common one, especially as we are working with proteins, is dialysis. So dialysis is, uh, I'm sure you've done this in probably in biology labs, uh, typically involves a tubing or membrane that is semi-permeable, and semi-permeable meaning that some things it lets pass through, other things don't pass through. And this schematically shows uh, a dialysis, for example. So we see on the left uh, a mixture that we might have from having busted open cells and centrifuged them and collected the liquid that was there. And that liquid may have proteins, which are shown here in red, and a lot of small molecules shown in green. And this is obviously not the scale, because the small molecules will be much, much smaller than the proteins are. If we put that into a buffer solution, which has none of those smaller molecules, of course, the process of diffusion uh, will occur if the membrane allows the small molecules to pass through it. And that's what happens here. The membrane, however, is um, selective in that it won't let larger molecules pass through it, so the proteins stay inside, and the smaller molecules pass out into the solution. So this is a common way of separating a protein from, from, from ions, for example. Yes? So her question is, are there ions or molecules that precipitate out because they're so dense? And the answer is yes, they will if they're associated with membranes, for example. So you will never have a situation where you precipitate something and you don't have ions in it because uh, membranes will have charges associated with them and those charges have to be balanced. Okay? So yes, they, they will. But they won't precipitate because they're dense. They precipitate because they're attracted to something that's in the membrane. Okay. All right, so um, what I've given you so far are just very general ways that we work with uh, large biomolecules. Now we're going to uh, move to a little bit more focused uh, type of analysis, and this is chromatography. Specifically, it's what's called column chromatography because we use columns uh, to perform this kind of an analysis. So you see on the screen a column that has been packed with a resin. And I'll talk, there's different kinds of resins, and what's going to happen is our sample that this liquid material that we've got is passed through this column and it interacts with individual uh, components of that resin. And so depending on what resin we've used, we can separate in different ways. So we can separate with re different resins and do different things. So one way to do it is to separate on the basis of charge using uh, an ion exchange resin, and I'll show you an example of that. Another is to separate on the basis of size, and this is a more selective kind of a size separation than we had before, uh, using a different resin. And finally, we can have a separation based on affinity. And affinity, of course, is the desire of a molecule to bind to something, and I'll show you an example of that. So three common types of column chromatography. There's actually a fourth that's a little bit more elaborate that I'll show you later. Oh, that's it. Actually, I didn't realize I had it there. Okay, so it's called reverse phase chromatography, and, I, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. Okay, well, let's start talking about ion exchange chromatography. Ion exchange chromatography, as its name suggests, involves the uh, swapping of ions. And you can see on the screen on the right uh, a typical resin, and you see on the left the functional part of that resin, the chemically functional part. So when we have a resin, typically uh, we have small beads. Gesundheit. We have small beads. And those small beads have chemically attached to them certain molecules that have certain properties associated with them. And in this case, the molecule that's attached, as I said, is, shows one on the left. And you can see that it's negatively charged. Well, that is covalently attached to the bead, meaning that no matter how much solution I pass through, that covalently attached thing is not going to come off. It's going to stay there. Well, if you have something negative stuck on the bead and you pass material through it that's a mixture of negatives and positives, you can imagine that the positives are going to stick and the things that are negative are not going to stick. They're going to come passing through the column. So with ion exchange, I can separate things on the basis of charge. And you say, what about something charged zero? If I said something charged zero, would you suppose it would stick or not stick? Answer, no, it will not. So only positively charged things are going to stick here. Well, this uh, image shows an actual ion exchange in process at a chemical level. So in black, we see all of the things that are attached to a, a bead. 
And on the left side, we see how that resin material on the bead starts. It starts with a counter ion. We can't just have negative charges in there. Everything has a counter ion. So when we start our um, separation, what we are doing is we're starting with material on the left. So there's sodium ions there that are counter ions for the negative charges on the beads. Well, the counter ions, of course, are not covalently attached. They can be released. And when they get released, they get replaced by other counter ions. Okay? Those other counter ions can be something like calcium, like we see here. Or it could be a protein that's positively charged. Right? And so the reason we say ion exchange is we're exchanging the initial counter ion for a different counter ion. Okay? So the initial counter ion is a sodium. That's how the material, that's how the process starts. The replacement, in this case, of calcium, or it could be a positively charged protein or a positively charged molecule, uh, displaces the sodium. The sodium comes off, and the sodium will come out of the column. And the material that you're interested in will stick to the column. That make sense? This is called cation exchange chromatography. Cation exchange. The positively charged sodium is being replaced, exchanged for a positively charged molecule in my sample. Okay. Anion exchange chromatography will be exactly the opposite. Anion exchange chromatography will have something covalently bound to the resin that will be positively charged, and it'll have a negative counter ion. And so when it comes off, then only negatively charged molecules will end up being stuck to that. Question over here, I saw a hand. Yeah? Will the exchange involve a more concise bonding scheme? Yeah. Not sure what you mean by that. Yeah, so um, I won't say concise, no, all right? Uh, this looks nice and tidy because you, know, you replace one with two. That doesn't have to happen. All that matters is that we have a plus attracted to a minus. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Okay, the question is, do, is there an ideal ratio of the substrate to the counter ion, for example, that's there? Um, the answer is basically no for that initial counter ion. However, it is important when we want to release our material from the resin. How do I, once I've got something stuck to the resin, let's say it's, I, I want to purify, I want to get all the positively charged proteins in this sample, and they all get stuck on here, right? But then how, once I've got them stuck, how do I get them off? And there's where the ratio becomes very important, because I flood the system with counter ions of sodium. Okay? Then that will release and it, things will come out. Okay? Now, the key to this is something I mentioned last time as well, and that is that these are non-covalent interactions. If this is a covalent interaction, nothing's coming off, guys. It's not a covalent interaction. Coming on, coming off, coming on, coming off, coming on, coming off, right? So if we put enough counter ions there in the, in the form of sodium, we will release the things that have been bound here. Yes? Well, in the, this case, if we put EDTA in, it would affect the, the, the calcium, sure, but that wouldn't necessarily have any effect on a protein that's there. Right. Okay. All right, let's talk about another uh, technique involving resins and beads. And this is a pretty cool one. This is called size exclusion. It's also called gel filtration chromatography. And it also uses little tiny beads. But now instead of having something chemically attached to their surface, these guys have little tiny holes, little tiny tunnels that run through them. And those little tiny tunnels have openings that come out to the solution. All right, they have little tiny openings that up. Didn't mean to do that. Little tiny openings that come out to the solution so that samples that are dissolved in the buffer can enter those tunnels if they're small enough. If they're small enough. 
Now, the way this technique works is that when we do an isolation this way, we will typically use beads that all have the same sized holes that allow the entry of molecules. If we have the same size holes, then we're going to be consistent in which size molecules are going to fit in and travel through those tunnels, and which size molecules are going to be too big and won't fit in and won't travel through those tunnels. Understand that? So the size of the holes for the tunnels is critical. It's called the exclusion limit. The exclusion limit. Well, if we pick an exclusion limit of the right size, we can separate on the basis of that size. How does that work? Well, notice in the figure that you see on the screen that those small red molecules are entering the tunnels and traveling through them. This is going to happen for every bead that's in that column. Small molecules are going to travel through tunnels. Big molecules are not going to travel through the tunnels because they can't get into them. So anything that's over the, the exclusion limit size is not going to enter the tunnels. And therefore, it's going to go sliding on the outside of the beads, go all the way through the column, and pass out. The first, one, the first molecules to elute, that is to come off of, a size exclusion column will be things that are bigger than the exclusion limit because they travel the shortest path. They don't go through all those tunnels. Whereas the small molecules that can go through all of those tunnels do, in fact, go through those tunnels and travel a longer distance. Everybody got that? Yes? How precise is this tool? Uh, it's OK, but it's not the best. So the question is, some of the small molecules aren't going to travel through the beads. Some of them are going to travel with the, with the larger molecules as well. The larger molecules will always have counter ions, but this is a way of separating all of the, the small molecules that are not counter ions. Okay? And in many cases, in most cases, that's actually a much greater number than those that are counter ions. Okay? Yeah? How small can the exclusion limit be? These, typically, these exclusion limits are typically on the order of thousands of molecular weight. 5,000 would be small. 50,000 to 100,000 would be large. So let's say if I had a bee that had an exclusion limit of 10,000 and I passed my sample through it, on average, things that are larger than 10,000 are going to come out first. Things that are smaller than 10,000 will come out last. We can actually see that in this slide right here. We can see a plot of material coming off the column. That's basically what we're looking at on the, on the y-axis. The higher the peak, the more material. So we see we inject a sample. And within about 120 milliliters, we start seeing the very first things coming out. That's called the void volume. And that's simply how much volume it takes to go from loading it all the way down to the very first thing coming out, meaning nothing has, has, has attached. That void volume is about 120 uh, milliliters here. And that's where the molecules that are the very largest, in this case, we use a size exclusion limit of 30,000 Daltons. And the molecules that are smaller than 30,000 come out later. And you see several peaks. We actually do see some separation that happens with this. The farther we go to the right, the, more, the smaller the molecules will be. Because the smaller they are, the more likely they will travel through tunnels. That's not a perfect technique, but it's a pretty cool way to separate on the basis of size. A cooler technique is this one, affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography. Yes, question? Good question. With chromatography, are we more concerned with things that get stuck or things that come out? It, it really depends. One of the things you're going to see, I'm glad you asked that question, one of the things that you will see with chromatography is that you adapt any isolation technique to what you're after. So you might decide, I don't give a damn about all the negatively charged proteins here. I only want the positively charged proteins, in which case I would use anion exchange chromatography. All the negatives would bind. The positives would come out. I'd be happy. Yeah, but you just adapt it to whatever you're after. Okay. Well, 
affinity chromatography uses the affinity okay, that a uh, molecule has for a given thing on the resin. So now I've modified my resin in a, in a specific way. So don't look at the, the screen for the moment. I'll tell you about that in a second. But I'm going to tell you another way. Let's imagine, for example, that I'm interested in isolating all the proteins in a cell that bind to ATP. Okay? I know they bind to ATP, and we all know that plenty of proteins bind to ATP. How do I purify those? Well, I take beads, I take those resins, and I could attach to the outside of each resin thousands of copies of ATP. So each bead is just bursting with ATP. I put those in a column, I load my proteins on, and then I let the, the sample go through. What's going to stick? Well, of course, anything that binds to the ATP on those beads is going to stick. And anything that doesn't bind to ATP is going to pass through. In one step, I've separated ATP binding proteins from other binding proteins. Right? How do I get those proteins off of that column? Any guesses? They're stuck. How do I get them off? First of all, they're not covalently stuck. What would you say? Not quite. That's not a bad guess, but that's not quite. There's a better thing than ATP. She said ATPase, an enzyme that breaks down ATP. Change the pH. Well, I could change the pH, but that might also denature my proteins, and I want my protein to be intact. Spencer? Flood it with unbound ATP. When I flood it with unbound ATP, remember this coming on, coming off, coming on, coming off. When it comes off, if I have a lot of unbound ATP, the protein binds it and comes off. It's no longer stuck to the bead. Okay? Now, what's on this screen? This, this screen is a special form of affinity chromatography. It's called histidine tagging. It's a really, really powerful tool. It's a little elaborate, so I'm going to take you through it um, briefly. Okay? To do this, I have to put onto a protein a sequence of about five to seven histidines in a row. Bang, 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 bang. All histidine. Well, how do I do that? Well, the one way I can do that is I can have the, the coding for the protein, and I can chemically put on the coding for histidine, 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 on one end of that coding or the other, so that my protein now will have its own coding and then attach to it a sequence of histidines. That's what's seen in the vector vector stuff that's up there. Everybody with me so far? So I've taken the protein that I'm interested in, I've changed the genetic code so that it's got a sequence of histidines attached to it. I put this, this coding into a cell, that's what's shown at the bottom, where I get transcription and translation, meaning I make RNA, and then that RNA for that protein is translated. And I can do this and have the cell make a ton of this protein. Let's imagine I'm working with human growth protein, or human growth hormone, rather, human growth hormone. Okay? And I want bacteria to do this for me. It's kind of hard for me to kill human beings and take their human growth hormone. At least it's not considered very ethical. Right? So I've got the gene for the human growth hormone, and I want to make a lot of human growth hormones, so I do what I just described to you. I put this into the bacteria, and the bacteria start synthesizing the human growth hormone with those histidines attached to it. Everybody with me? You say, oh, well, you've got it. Well, no, I don't, because in addition to the human growth hormone, I got all those bacterial proteins that the bacterium is making all the time anyway. I've got to purify my material away from theirs. And this is where the histidine tagging comes in. With a histidine tag, okay, histidine will bind to nickel. So I make a column that's got nickel attached to it. Well, since none of the bacterial proteins are going to have that histidine tag, what's going to happen? When I pour that mixture of bacterial proteins and the human growth hormone protein on there, the human growth hormone protein is going to stick. All the bacterial proteins go through in one step. I now have human growth hormone that's on there. How am I going to get it off? There's a couple ways, but nickel is one, histidine is another. Okay? All right? 
my protein comes out, but oh, I've got extra amino acids on there. Do I want to put that in people? Maybe, maybe not, right? It turns out that those histidine tagged proteins, okay, that are there, I, can, I have an enzyme that I can clip off the histidines. So I end up with her human growth hormone that the bacteria made, and I purify very, very easily. So histidine tagging is a really powerful way of isolating a protein that you want in literally one step. It's very, very commonly used in biotechnology. Now, that's kind of confusing, so I'll stop and take any questions you might have about that. Where? Yeah. So the one step refers simply to passing it through the column. That's correct. The other steps to make it are obviously more involved. But once I've got that, I can purify that, that, that protein in one step. Yes? Are there no other proteins in the bacterium that have those histidines? For the most part, no. Because we put a fairly long sequence on there, and it's just by randomness uh, not appearing on other, other uh, bacterial proteins. OK. Reverse phase HPLC chromatography, another type of chromatography. This HP stands for high performance, but a lot of people say it stands for high pressure because it involves very high pressures, thousands of pounds of pressure. Because the columns that we use here contain microscopic or nanoscopic beads. The beads are very, very, very tiny, and they're packed very, very, very tight. The advantage of that is that the samples that pass through it have a lot more opportunity to interact with the uh, material than when the beads are bigger. The smaller something gets, the higher its ratio of surface area to volume is. So these have very, very tiny beads packed very, very tightly. So to push samples through, we've got to have high pressure to do that. Okay? This is not a figure you're going to need to worry about. I only show it to you just to give you an idea of what all is there. It largely involves a high pressure pump, which is shown there as uh, components two and three. And it's just pushing solvent or buffer through a place where I can inject my protein into the system. That's number six there. And again, you're not going to need to draw this, so don't worry about that. Okay. The sample that enters the column, which is at position nine, it gets separated in that column. I'll tell you the basis of the separation in a minute. And then it goes out to a detector that detects when something comes off. Okay? So I can collect those samples that come off if I want, if it's something of interest to me, and then I can, um, I, I've, I've purified my, my material. Oh, back up. Okay, so how does this system work? Well, it turns out that the beads that we use in reverse phase chromatography have something stuck to them that's not an ion, it's not a specific molecule for binding, but rather it's a long nonpolar tail like a long end of a fatty acid, just the nonpolar part. Okay? Well, if I have such a setup, what, how are, what separations are going to occur as things pass through? Well, what's going to happen is that things that are polar or charged are not going to interact with that nonpolar material, and they're going to come out first. Things that are nonpolar are going to do a lot of interaction with those long nonpolar tails on the resins, and they'll come out last. So with reverse phase HPLC chromatography, I separate on the basis of polarity. Most polar first, least polar last. Everybody got that? And you might wonder, is there a normal phase? And there is, and we don't need to worry about it here. Reverse phase is most commonly used. Okay. Well, now we turn our attention to another kind of separation. It's not something we call chromatography, but we call electrophoresis. And I imagine most of you in here, how many people have run a gel? Almost everybody, yeah, okay. So, uh, you know what a gel is. You know it looks like jello, right? Um, there's a couple of kinds of material that are used for gels. The first I'm going to describe is that of agarose, which is one of the most common ones you likely would have run. And agarose provides a support. That support is what I, I like to think of as a sort of a mesh through which the buffer is um, embedded. Okay? So there uh, shows the repeating unit of agarose uh, support. And agarose is basically a polymer. 
of a carbohydrate that actually comes from seaweed. Right? It's a mesh-like support. And it's mesh-like, meaning that we could imagine it's something like this, right? And we have that buffer that's sitting inside of all of this. And this is in three dimensions, not just the two dimensions of my hands. Okay? And so if you see the way I've placed my fingers, that mesh provides holes. And it's through those holes that molecules pass. The holes are where the molecules pass. The holes have to be big enough, obviously, for big molecules to pass. Electrophoresis is typically done on very large molecules. Agarose gel electrophoresis is done almost exclusively on either DNA or RNA. The largest biomolecules in cells, by a long ways, are the nucleic acids. Way bigger than proteins. Way, way bigger than proteins. Okay? Now, so we have a mixture. We have that gel back there. We load the sample in those wells, as you all have undoubtedly done. Okay. In the case of DNA, you know that DNA has a phosphate-charged backbone. And that phosphate-charged backbone grows as the DNA grows. If I add more nucleotides to a DNA, every time I add a nucleotide, I add a phosphate. The number of phosphates that's there is proportional to the length. So the length divided by phosphates is constant. If I have a large one, I have more phosphates. If I have a small one, I have fewer phosphates. But the ratio of the length to the phosphates is constant. That's a very important point. The ratio of the length to the phosphates is constant. Okay? These act like rods. Okay, we think of a rod as just a long, straight structure, right? Samples get loaded in wells. And then we use an electrical current to force the nucleic acid to enter that mesh and start traveling through it. Well, since we have negatively charged molecules, we have negatively charged DNA molecules, we have a negatively charged um, um, electrode at the beginning, and we have a positively charged electrode at the other end. So the negatively charged DNA is pushed away and into the gel, and the positively charged electrode is attracting it in that direction. Since the length to charge ratio is constant, the molecules move solely on the basis of their size. The smallest ones move fastest because they can just zip right through there. The largest ones more slowly. Okay? Largest move the slowest. And we can actually see one right here. This shows. Um, a, a, a set of DNAs that someone separated. They had different tissues that they isolated them from. And we can see, for example, that the loading well is up at the top. The largest molecules travel the least distance. And the smallest molecules travel the most distance. Okay. Now, there's another kind of uh, separation I'll talk about next time called uh, a, the um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. But I thought we would do a song at this point. This song was actually not written by me. It's the only one I do, either this term or next term, that was not written by me. It was written by one of my former students, and some of you know her. She's actually the founder of SDO. Her name is Tari Tan. There's a math that you should know that's very huge. It's spinning round and round inside the centrifuge. The supernatant pellet too, you choose the one that's right for you, and from there we purify what's inside. So size exclude filtration is the way to go. The beads have small proteins, you say in the wind, you know. The largest ones, they come out fast, the smallest ones eluding last, and the proteins purify by their size. Electrons power gel electrophoresis. The protein is denatured thanks to SDS. 
Proteins in a minus state get sorted by atomic weight. Smaller ones in speedy mode to the anode. Ion exchange is special chromatography. To switch cations, you must have a minus feed. Upon the feed, the proteins bind their positive, not any kind of the others wash right through. How to you? Oh, my, this song has given you a mighty list. Perhaps we'll just skip over old dialysis. So study H, P, L, and C. If you have questions, talk to me. You will get through protein health. You'll do well. All right, guys. See you on Friday. <laughs>